What do you say, Lighthouse? I hope that you are having an incredible evening and I know that it's only getting ready to get better. I get the great privilege tonight to introduce to you a friend of the house, an instrumental part of the LH staff, uh, our pastor of care, and also uh, an elder of this church. And he is none other than Dave Thompson. We know him around here as DT for short. And he shares with me um, so much of the heavy lifting as far as the pastoral staff goes. He actually spearheads the counseling portion of Lighthouse Church, where he deals with families and crisis, relationships, finances, and a myriad of other things. And he is incredible at the calling God has on his life. Um, he's led worship here since the very beginning of Lighthouse and now he is an instrumental part of so many other facets of what we do as a church. This evening he's going to be bringing a word to you out of 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that he's entitled Living Life with an Eternal Perspective. I've listened to sound bites of it over the past several weeks and I'm encouraged every time I hear it and I know you will be as well. If anyone can speak to this matter, it would be DT. He has endured hardships like a champ. He has gone, gone through ups and downs um, with faithfulness and diligence like no other one I've ever seen. He inspires me to be a better follower of Jesus and I know he's getting ready to inspire you. So would you please join with me and give a warm lighthouse welcome to the one and only DT. Well, thank you guys very much. That was a, uh, that was a nice introduction. I've, uh, I've been on staff for about a year and a half now, and uh, I'm the oldest guy on staff, uh, something that uh, I'm reminded of constantly by the young whippersnappers <laughs> with, their, with their hippie clothes and their newfangled technology, but the joke's on them, I'm just as cool and just as down as they are, just as up. <laughs> My MySpace page is off the his -a. I can fax with the best of them. And just the other day, I created my own account on um, Snapface, so I'm on... <laughs> I am all over it. Um, so this is the verses series. We get to preach on anything we want to, and when they, uh, when they asked me to do it, I'm, I just wanted you guys to know this. When they asked me to do it, I said, the only way I'm doing that is if you let me have the Saturday night service, because that's the best service with the best people in all of Lighthouse. <clears throat> uh, I can't lie. The... Uh, truth is I'm leading worship at Pasadena tomorrow, and this is the only service I could be able to speak at. But that doesn't change anything. You're the best. <clears throat> you guys are so easy. All right, let's pray and get started. Let's get serious. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for everybody here, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have rescued us from our sin and from the wrath of the Father, Lord God. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this room tonight and every one of us would leave here more intent on following harder after Jesus than we were when we came in. In your great name we pray, amen. Uh, the, verse, the verses that I picked are, um, it's, a, it's a passage of, of a few verses that I've been obsessed with for quite a while now, and it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. And they say, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweigh them all. It's a very rich passage, but the thing that grabbed me when I read that is the line, our light and momentary troubles. Because when I first stumbled upon this scripture, it was in the middle of, of the year-long battle that Mr. Paul, Paul Sr. had that was so difficult and a good friend of mine is also battling cancer right now in the fight for his life. And I thought back to the darkest time in my life and I thought, Lord, how, 
how are we supposed to reconcile those kinds of things and the sufferings that some of you undergo and, and think of them as light and momentary troubles? And the answer is we do that by having an eternal perspective. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. Just so we, we, we understand the term. Eternal, I think we all understand that. Never ending, forever, eternal. Perspective means how something looks from where you stand. Meaning there's this event or this object and depending on which side of it you're standing or how close or how far from it you're standing, it will look different from your perspective. We all know this if we've ever um, gone out to M&T Bank Stadium to watch the, uh, the Ravens pound on the Steelers. <laughs> whether, whether you, if you're sitting, I was hoping to get more than that, but whatever. <clears throat> there we go. So whether you're sitting in the last row of the upper deck in the end zone or 10 rows from the field on the 50-yard line, you see a different game, sort of, because you're looking from a different perspective. There are things you will see and won't see based on your perspective, where you are in relation to that game. Um, Think about our kids, the way, the perspective from which we view our own children is vastly different than the way other people see our children. They don't have that blood love for them that we have, so they see them differently. The cool thing about perspective when it comes to our lives is that you can change your life by changing your perspective even though nothing has changed. I know that's a lot of use of the word change, but you know what I mean? Circumstances don't have to change. Say say nothing has changed in your life, but we change our perspective and it can change our life. For instance, let's say you or I are an ungrateful person. An ungrateful person chooses to look at the things they don't have and complain about that. Look at the negative things in their life and complain about that. And, and that, that, you know, that creates an attitude and a persona within that person and it influences the way other people see them. If that same person, you or I, decides to change our perspective and look at the blessings and the good things that is in their life, it will change their attitude. It will change the way they're perceived by other people. No circumstance in their life has changed. They've just changed their perspective and it changes who they are. So tonight I want to talk about looking at our lives with eternal perspective. Not just looking at our lives as the the 70 or 80 years that we have on this planet, but For those of us who believe in and are following Jesus, we've already begun an eternal journey. We're just going to change form and change locations at some point. But we're on an eternal journey now. And that matters in this life. And I hope to make that point to you guys tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about three benefits or blessings of having an eternal perspective. The first one is that an eternal perspective reminds us that even now we're investing in eternity. Look at Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I just want to point out very obviously in that scripture, we are able to store up treasures in heaven. We're going to talk about what that means. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 through 10 says, For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, 
so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. See, as it turns out, what we do in this life matters in that life. And I want to be real clear. I'm not talking about doing good works to earn our way to heaven. Not talking about that at all. Lighthouse doesn't believe that, and we certainly don't believe the Bible says that. We get to heaven by the grace of God and the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. That's how we get to heaven. I'm talking about after we're saved, after we're believers, the works that we do, the character that we build in ourselves after that. That's what this is all about. See, one of the unwavering universal principles that God has established is that of sowing and reaping. The Bible says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. What a man sows, that he will also reap. And we're not, we're not all equal here on earth because here on earth because we all you know, have different levels of commitment to Jesus and different levels of, of service to him. And we, are, we, um, we reap different things because we sow different things. It would be inconsistent of God's unchangeable character to think that the life we live for him while we're here would not be subject to sowing and reaping going forward into eternity. We're not all going to hold the same status in heaven. Um, we'll all we'll all be full of love and joy and heaven's going to be perfect. But because of the rewards, the Bible talks about rewards in the New Testament a lot for the, for the works we do here for Jesus. Because of those rewards, we'll have, we'll have a different status or different capacity to experience the love and joy and peace in heaven, right? A pint jar can be full, and a quart jar can be full, right? They're both full. They're both, they both have as much as they can have, but they have different capacities. And Scripture speaks to this. It's, it's really interesting. I've learned so much from doing this study myself. So how do we build up these treasures in heaven? The Bible says that God, the godly character that we build in our lives, the way we serve Jesus, the testimony that we present to other people and the way we serve his church, these things are eternal things that will carry over into our lives in heaven. Godly character, it, we will take that into eternity with us. Look at 1 Corinthians 3. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God. This is Paul talking about him and Apollos who are traveling around, preaching the gospel, establishing churches. But only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation using gold, silver, and costly stones, those are good things, wood, hay, or straw, those are weak things, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. The day is judgment day when Jesus says, I've had enough of that sinful planet. I'm going to end it and establish my kingdom forever. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. See, once again, this isn't talking about getting saved. This is talking about every one of us will stand before the judgment throne in the final day, and our works will be tested through the fire. And some of us will be rewarded, and some of us, I always laugh when I read this, because uh, Paul Sr. said, you know, some of us are going to have to sneak through the pearly gates with smoke coming off our hind ends, <laughs> right? Because it says they will all be saved, 
but some will be rewarded and some not so much. See, every time we bless or serve another person, every time we don't complain, every time we turn the other cheek and pray for our enemy, every time we stop our tongue from speaking evil, every time we share the gospel with somebody who's lost, we're laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven and we will be rewarded. What are these rewards? Um, Everything I read and the Bible scholars, not really sure. They all agree it won't be physical things. It'll be our capacity in heaven to, to experience the joy and the peace and the wonder of what, what, is, what Jesus has to offer us all in heaven. And listen, what I am not saying tonight by making this point is that we should all go out and start doing a bunch of good stuff so we can selfishly pile up points in heaven, all right? That won't work. God, God's always looking for, at, at our hearts, right? And he's always looking for us to, to do good for him out of love for him, out of a desire to be pleasing to him. Um, God's love and, and his love in us is always self-sacrificing. It's never selfish. I'm just simply saying that we need to be aware. We need to have the eternal perspective and be, in, and be aware that the, the things we do for Jesus down here, the way we love him and pursue him and work for him, not only brings him glory and us joy here, it will bring him glory and us joy forever. What we do now matters then. Um, Jim Elliott, the, the, the famous missionary to China, has a great quote. I mean, this is really good. I don't know how much you people paid to get in here tonight, but after I read this quote, you're making money. He said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. See, that's eternal perspective, being more aware that we need to invest in eternal things and not on things that are temporary that this world has to offer us. The second point I wanted to make about having an eternal perspective is that it reminds us of our hope. Now, I want to tell you guys this. For for all of my um, Christian walk, my attitude towards heaven has always been, you know what, it's going to be so glorious and so incredible that we can't even imagine it. So I'm not going to waste time trying. I'm not going to burn up brain cells trying to imagine what heaven is like or thinking about heaven when I really can't. And I tell you, after doing this, after studying this stuff, uh, I am convinced that that is absolutely a wrong attitude to have because heaven is our hope. It's our, it's our ultimate goal. What, if, we, if, if there was no heaven, if there was no eternity, why would we even bother following Jesus or, or you know, doing, doing any of this? Because we have a home waiting for us and that's our hope. That's often what Paul was referring to in his letters when he talked about hope. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you might know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Our glorious inheritance is eternal life in heaven with Jesus. Titus 3 says, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured, poured out on us generously through Christ Jesus our Savior, so that, all right, he saved us, he poured out his mercy on us, he washed us in rebirth and renewed us in the Holy Spirit, so that for the purpose of having been justified by grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Heaven and eternal life is our hope. And there's, there's nothing wrong with reminding ourselves of that 
once in a while. Let's just talk about heaven for a minute. Um, I certainly don't claim to be a biblical expert on it, but uh, how many of you, when you picture heaven or think about heaven, think of some place up in the sky, there's clouds, we're floating around, something like that. Show of hands, seriously. Oh, well, you're all way ahead of me. That's, that's, that's always what I've pictured. And, and I just always found that to be very uninspiring. But um, as it turns out, um, when you study the Bible and what it has to say about heaven, we are ultimately going to be in physical bodies in a physical place. The Bible talks in several places that our physical bodies will be resurrected from the dead and become new and healthy and perfect, which means you guys are all going to look a lot better. (laughs) I am pretty much going to look like this. (laughs) All right. I didn't think it was that funny. But, th- but that's, 2 Peter 3 says, so we'll have physical bodies and we'll be on a physical place that the Bible calls the new earth. In 2 Peter 3, he says, in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. In Revelations 21, 1 through 4, this is where the disciple John was on the Isle of Patmos at the end of his life and God gave him a vision for how the last days would be. And he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Amen. (laughs) See, we normally think of going up to heaven, right? To live forever with God, but his promise is that God will come down to live with us in our place on the new earth. That's a whole lot easier to grasp. So let's, let's imagine, since, since heaven will ultimately be a physical place with physical bodies, let's just imagine, just, just for a minute, what a day in heaven might be like for us. We'll wake up, remember there's no sin, no more sin, and that scripture we read, no more pain, no more, no more mourning, no more death. So we'll wake up in the morning, if we sleep, I don't know. Scholars say, based on what the Bible says, that we will eat and drink and work and and interact with each other and have relationships. So we get up in the morning, no sore knees, no, no aching back, no headaches, and we have a day to look forward to with absolutely nothing to dread totally at peace. We eat a delicious breakfast, which for me means chocolate chip ice cream for breakfast. I'm all over that. We'll drive to work, whatever work will look like. No fear of road rage from me. No fear. You'll, you'll love your job. The Bible says that we'll be serving the Lord in, in heaven. Don't know what that means, but it'll be good. Won't have to worry about backbiting coworkers or having a jerk for a boss. That'll be a refreshing change for me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> 
Love you, man. <laughs> but here's the deal. At the end of the day, we, we will have had no fear, no anxiety, no depression, no temptation, won't be battling an addiction, won't be battling a disease, won't be in a wheelchair anymore. Our relationships with people will be healthy and loving and encouraging. We won't be contentious or awkward or hurtful or hateful towards one another. We'll be totally at peace. Literally, not a worry in the world. Not one. We'll be at rest. We'll be at peace. We'll experience joy beyond anything we know now. And that won't just be one day. That'll be every day. Forever. And, and in all this talk of heaven, what, have I, what did I not even mention? Did anybody pick up on that? Who did I not even mention? Jesus, the presence of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Who knows what it's going to be like to experience his presence firsthand like that? He is the whole reason heaven will be heaven. He's the source of joy and the source of peace and the source of fun and pleasure. It couldn't be heaven without him. This is our hope people. We, I say all the time that I think as Christians, we take for granted too often the fact that we know who created. I know who created me. I know who created everything. I know why I'm here. I know what my purpose is, and I know where I'm going when it's all done. I mean, these are the things that people are out there scrambling around and clawing around in the dark trying to find, just like we were before we knew Jesus. But we know where our hope is. Listen. And they all lived happily ever after. For us who know Jesus and follow him, that's not, that's not just a fairy tale. That's not just the last line to some sappy Hollywood movie. That is reality for us. We're going to all live happily after. That's the promise that God has made to us and paid for with the blood of his son. Feel free to rejoice in it. Feel free to think about it once in a while. That's our hope. My third point is that living with an eternal perspective helps us in our suffering. And it helps us in two ways, really. The first one is that it gives purpose to our suffering. Back to, back to the original verse, 2 Corinthians 4 um, verse 17, the second half of that says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. They're achieving something for us. Our troubles, or more specifically, the way we deal with our troubles and the way we view the perspective from which we view our troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far, out, far outweighs that suffering. See, suffering and trials and tragedies and the hard things in our life builds character in us, right? We all know that. Our, our human nature, unfortunately, is such that, man, when everything's going good and easy, we're, we're coasting, right? We're not, we're not um, you know, scrambling to build better character we're, we're, we're resting, man. Everything's good. I got this. I'm cool. It's not until things start to fall apart. It's not until we get worried. It's not until we suffer that re God uses those things to build real character in our life, character that we will carry into eternity with us. 
And the other way that having an eternal perspective helps us in our su- suffering is that it, 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 it can shrink the scope for us of what we're going through at that time. You know what I mean? Now, I'm not, I'm not stupid. I'm not, well, I'm not being stupid right now. I'm not, I'm not saying that having an eternal perspective auto- automatically makes you feel better when you're in the midst of some, something really heavy and, and really suffering. But if we do, well, let me read Romans 8, verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. See, see here's, here's what we tend to do too often is we're in the middle of this trial, this suffering, this hard time in our life, and that's all we look at. That's all we see. That's all we think about. We zero in on that thing, and that makes our entire world depressing and overwhelming, and we can feel worthless, and all this is just pointless. But what we have to do is back out and look at it from an eternal perspective. I remember Sammy, something he was preaching a while ago, I remember him saying, God calls us higher, meaning, meaning to back that perspective up and put this trial or this suffering that we're going through in, in perspective, in the perspective of eternity, right? Because you, if you were to run a timeline and that represented eternity, our life on this earth would be less than a little pinpoint, right? I know it doesn't feel like that when we're in the midst of something really hard. But when we step back and look at our life, our current situation from eternal perspective, we find purpose in it. We see that there's something much, much bigger going on than just our suffering. He works all things for the good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose, right? We have to remind ourselves of that sometimes. There's an eternal purpose involved in what we're experiencing. I I can speak to this personally. This, this, I mean, this works. When, When I found out 14 years ago, the day after I found out that my first wife was in the midst of an affair. I, I took a long walk the next morning, and I, I so I remember this crystal, crystal clear. Now, let me, let me just say that I was 42 years old when that happened, and um, many of you have heard me say this stuff before, but I had, I had had as good and as easy and as blessed a life as you could realistically ask for for 42 years. I mean, nothing... Nothing difficult, nothing tragic had happened to me. This was the first thing that had ever rocked my world. And I remember thinking, okay, Thompson, the, the, the rubber's meeting the road now. Are you going to stick with Jesus? And two things came to my mind immediately. It had to be the Holy Spirit. The first one was, um, okay, yeah, turn away from Jesus and turn towards what? Where else am I going to find my help? Where else am I going to find my peace? Where else am I going to find comfort and strength? Why would I turn away from him? And the second thing was, and this is my point, the second thing was, you know what? I'm sticking with Jesus because even if the last 30 or 40 years of this life are miserable, and empty and destitute like I felt at that time. The next 900 trillion are going to be glorious beyond anything I could ever imagine. And see, and see that shrunk my suffering. Not, not to the point where I wasn't upset anymore, but it, it provided a foundation underneath of it that gave me strength and that reminded me that this is this what I'm experiencing right now this is not forever this is what the Bible calls a mist or a breath what's coming forever is glorious beyond belief 
See, life is short, eternity is long, and judgment is sure. I want to go back to the original verse because I, I, uh, I, left, I intentionally left one verse off the end of it when I read it to you guys originally. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. My challenge to you and myself tonight is to remember that we are connected to eternity now. There's a heaven coming, an eternity coming, and it's beyond, it's glorious and incredible and awesome beyond what we can imagine. It's our hope. It provides purpose in our suffering. It gives meaning to serving Jesus and loving other people now because that's not just for now, that's forever. And if you're here this evening and you're unsure about your eternity, about your eternal status, or maybe even fearful, I, I, can, I can understand that. I just want you to know, like every one of us, you're a sinner who needs a savior. And Jesus Christ is that one and only savior. And before you leave here tonight, you can be rock solid sure of your eternal destiny. There'll be people on the front of the stage after, after the worship team plays another song and you can come up and talk to one of them and they'll walk you through how to, how to get to know this Jesus and walk with him and spend eternity with him. Eternal perspective. It's not just about here. We need to live this day for that day. Amen. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy and for your grace that we, a bunch of sinners like us, would even be allowed to have a way to get to heaven, a way to spend eternity in your presence, Lord. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for buying that way for us on the cross. Lord, I pray that you convict our hearts, remind us of what our hope is, Lord, and that more and more we would live this day for you, that we would live this day for that day when we get to be with you forever. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen.